Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Palacios, and we're going to bring a new topic for today, which is quite complex, but at the same time necessary for general understanding of nutrition. So in the series of Nutrition for Your Life, we're going to talk about micronutrients today. So just to give you some background of who I am, I am a naturopathic doctor, graduated from 2017 at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. I also have a certification in craniosacral therapy and massage therapy. My focus is a lot in neck pain, headaches, migraines. I also tend to work a lot with gut health, autoimmunity, and other chronic conditions with safe and effective natural therapies. So some of the objectives here, before we get into them, I just wanna give the disclaimer that the information presented here is only for educational purposes. So please consult with your healthcare practitioner and professional who is trained in nutritional science before you try any of this following minerals and vitamins on your own. So with that, number one, we're going to learn the truths and myths behind the vitamins and minerals you see in supplements. And we're going to approach it with caution on the intake of vitamins and minerals, even though they seem safe. I want to bring into light the misconception that because it's a vitamin or a mineral, it must be safe. It is not so. So we're going to learn some of that. And also you'll learn what are some specific vitamins and minerals for too. So let's get started first into the water-soluble vitamins. And these are the B and the C vitamins. So what does water-soluble mean? First, it means that they go through your system easily, they do not build toxicity, and you can build tolerance long-term. So most of these vitamins are vitamins you can take long-term and they won't cause any damage or toxicity in your body because your body can easily detox them, use them, and just get rid of them. So we're gonna start with the first set of the B vitamins. So this is this is the list of the ones we're gonna talk about. And the B vitamins, just wanna keep in mind that they're for your metabolic needs. So essentially they're for everything. So they help process fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, which are your main macronutrients that you eat. They also help with DNA regulation, multiplying cells and reproduction, and even for neurotransmitters, which are your brain chemicals. All right, we'll get started first with B1, also known as thiamine. So this B vitamin works on making fats and carbohydrates into energy. Again, I am not gonna get too much into the science and biochemistry of this because I want you guys to understand the essential usage of this. If you're interested, again, feel free to let me know and I can share more about it in the comments, but we're gonna make it simple for the enthusiast to just understand what these minerals and vitamins do. Uh, so B vitamins are essential for survival. Diamond also needs magnesium to work, which is a mineral we're going to discuss later. And it's also great for these conditions like blood sugar control, like you see in diabetes, epilepsy management, and voluntary muscle control, so skeletal muscle. Now, keep in mind that alcohol depletes this vitamin. So if you are a regular drinker, be careful that you can deplete this vitamin long-term. And these are some foods that are high in thiamine. Some of them are the beans, the bean legume family, sunflower seeds, and asparagus. The next one is B2, also known as riboflavin. So this vitamin also works on making fats and carbohydrates into energy. They are essential for metabolic functions. 
they are a fuel for the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. Now, because cells are everywhere in our, in our bodies, this vitamin is essential for its function. Riboflavin can also be used for eyesight, migraines, and one note to keep in mind is that chemotherapy highly depletes this vitamin and it causes something called hypoglossia, which is a swelling of the tongue. Now, these are some foods with riboflavin being the highest forms in them. And as you can see, it's a lot of different vegetables and fruits. Uh, so salmon, eggs, seaweed, Brussels sprouts, winter squash. The next one we're gonna talk about is niacin. So it works on making fats and carbohydrates into energy, again, just like the B1 and 2. And keep in mind that there are two forms of this vitamin. One is niacin, which is used for blood sugar management and cholesterol management, and niacinamide. And this has a different usage, which is more for beauty products, for acne. And you will see that as an ingredient if you read the beauty products in them. A lot of them will have this compound in them. Another thing that can be used is for topical use of osteoarthritis. And this is the chemical formula of niacin and niacinamide. And where you can see that is in poultry, bread, fruits, veggies. So it's essentially in most foods. The next B vitamin is going to be pentothenate or B5. This is the chemical structure. And again, it works on turning fats and carbs into energy. And it's essential for all metabolic functions. So it is very, very difficult to live with a deficiency of this vitamin. It's also great for if you supplement for cholesterol management in people with sugar issues and burnout, because this chemical or this vitamin helps to synthesize cortisol and provides proper usage of cortisol, which is the stress hormone in our bodies. Here are some rich foods, such as sunflower seeds, tomatoes, cauliflower, and salmon. The next one is going to be pyrodoxine, pyrodoxine, or pyrodoxine, pyrodoxine, however you'd like to pronounce it, or B6. Now this is the chemical formula, and this one works on storing carbs in the liver. So if you have high levels of glucose in your blood, then this vitamin allows the liver to store extra glucose into its storage form called glycogen or in muscles, but in this case is the liver. It also helps with the synthesis of hemoglobin, which is an oxygen transport molecule. So it's great for anemia basically. And it also just makes the cell use protein at a better rate. So it's used for anemia, as we've mentioned, carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a condition of the wrist, and migraines, and also menstrual bleeding management. Now, toxicity can develop in this water-soluble vitamin, even though we mentioned that some of, most of this don't, but in this case, you have to be careful. So. If you have high amounts of pyridoxine for long term, it can cause brain cell degeneration. So it is important that you know and you take the right amount of this vitamin. And it works great with magnesium. So here are some foods that you can find pyridoxine. So salmon, meat, and oats, and uh, spinach, as you can see here. The next one is B7, known as biotin. So biotin is something that you'll see a lot on carbon building, which will explain what it does exactly. So it basically helps to keep structures of the body in shape. 
So it's going to work for hair loss, which again is a huge compound for hair loss management, brittle nails, and skin inflammation management. And keep in mind that this vitamin is actually created in your gut bacteria or in your gut. If you have a healthy microflora, then a lot you don't really need to supplement this vitamin. And keep in mind also that if you have a habit of eating raw egg yolks long term, it can deplete this vitamin. And these are some effects of the or these are some foods rich in biotin. And you'll notice that egg yolks that are cooked are the highest amount of biotin. Walnuts and peanuts and hazelnuts are like the highest amount of biotin that you'll find in foods. The next one is B9, known as folate, or you'll see it in some form forms or supplements as folic acid. So I'm gonna mention about that. But first, this works on DNA and RNA synthesis. It's very necessary for pregnancy care, especially the early stages, like the first trimester, because of the DNA and, and RNA synthesis. The cells are multiplying a lot because you have a baby growing and it's gonna need a lot of folate to make that reproduction successful. Uh, it's great for anemia, alcoholism, and even some heart conditions that have a mutations called NTHFR. Now, this vitamin is depleted heavily by autoimmune medications, some of them being methotrexate. So be careful with that. Now, for the form, you want to make sure you're taking the methylfolate as your B9 supplement. That's the best form and the most absorbable form. And folic acid is a synthetic form of folate, so I do not recommend you taking it. And here are some foods high in folate. As you notice, a lot of leafy greens, legumes, and beets. Next, we're going to go into this large chemical compound that's called B12, or simply actually simply B12, but more complex, cobalamin. So this chemical formula, or B12, works on fat metabolism specifically, DNA control, which is known as methylation, which allows DNA to be regulated, whether to make more DNA or stop making more DNA. And it's great for pernicious anemia, again, a form of anemia, folate deficiency, and fatigue and depression management. And that's why you'll see that this vitamin is recommended a lot for people who have high levels of stress and high levels of tiredness. Now, keep in mind that this vitamin is depleted by PPIs, also known as protein pop inhibitors, such as omeprazole or Prilosec. So, the reason is because this proton pump inhibitors, they inhibit the intrinsic factor made in the stomach, and that intrinsic factor binds to the B12 compound in the system. So it won't be able to attach, and you'll have less availability of B12 in your system. Another thing too, if you have a healthy gut flora, you'll be able to make your own B12. And that's why kombucha is another food that can provide B12 um, supplement. Now, toxicity can develop, but this is of years of consistent intake, and it can cause organ damage. So again, keep that in mind. And these are some natural sources of B12. A, a lot of it is animal products and some shiitake mushrooms. The next one, is going to be not the B vitamins because we just finished that, but the next one, vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid. So this one works on as an antioxidant, also helps with iron absorption, and it's great for chronic infections, scurvy, which isn't something that we see much nowadays, and viral infections, because again, they protect the body from 
oxidation of damage, basically. Now, toxicity can happen, but it again, it takes a long period of time and you will have to be taking very high amounts and it can lead to kidney stones and diarrhea. And foods high in vitamin C, as you know, are the citrus fruits, tomatoes, acai berries, and the big one is peppers, bell peppers. So peppers is another source of high amounts of vitamin C, naturally. The next one, it's more on the category of other because it doesn't quite belong in the B or C vitamin, but I did want to mention it here. And it's called SAMI or S-adenosylmethionine. Now this supplement isn't necessarily in foods, but it's more of a uh, synthetic form that is a transition molecule in the body. But this one works on DNA and RNA protein synthesis and recycling. So it helps with the process of DNA. It also helps make neurotransmitters like epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are your main stress hormones for the drive of uh, the initial power stress. And this is this supplement is great for depression and fatigue management. And it works well with B12 and B9. So folate and cobalamin and SAMI are three, three vitamins you can take together for better effects. And this is just a supplement in case you're curious to learn more about it. Now that we went over the water-soluble vitamins, we're going to go into the fat-soluble vitamins. So these are a little different. So they're transported with other fats. So it's recommended that you take fat-soluble vitamins with fatty foods. They can lead to toxicity because the fat cells can store them and it can stay in your system and organs long-term. And the fat-soluble vitamins, as you see, are A, K, E, and D. So let's first get into the first one, A. So as, as you see, I'm giving you all the different forms of vitamin A derivatives. And these are known as retinol, retinal, retinoic acid, retinol palmitate, and beta carotene. Now, beta carotene is like the natural form in foods. And it tends to be a safer form. But the other forms are things that you can read in supplements, and beauty products. So what's it work on? Well, it works on the skin and eyesight. So keep that in mind. Immune boosting, very important for the immune system. So it works a lot on, as you can imagine, viral infections, reproductive health, photosensitivity, and toxicity. We need to be cautious with pregnancy. So it is recommended that women who are pregnant to avoid any form of vitamin A supplement or beauty products with them. And, and it doesn't mean that women cannot take, pregnant women cannot take vitamin A, but the dosage needs to be regulated by a nutritionist because it is important to have vitamin A in the system anyway. Uh, and then Accutane, as you will notice in the warning label, you'll see that you cannot take any alcohol or vitamin A supplementation when you're taking this medication for acne. And the reason is because it can overload the liver with toxicity and cause damage to the liver. And it works great with zinc, especially for the immune boosting properties. And these are some vitamin rich foods, carrots, papaya, ghee, mango, and liver. Another form, as you can see here, is vitamin D, D2 and D3. So we have ergocalciferol and cholecalciferol. So ergocalciferol is more of the plant-based and cholecalciferol is more the animal product, which is easily more easily absorbable in the body. So this vitamin D works on cell growth and function. So it's universal. It's necessary for the body to do its job. That's why it is important to keep your vitamin D levels in check every so often. 
It also helps with infections or the immune conditions. And you will see that it's because it's going to help with bone health, depression, and cancer prevention. Because again, it protects the cells from growth and function. Now, I put this little chart to make you aware of how complex the pathway of vitamin D is. Because we do have vitamin D present in our skin at the moment. The problem is that it's not active. So you get UV rays in the skin. And that UV rays is going to activate that molecule of precursor of vitamin D. And once it's active, it's going to go into the bloodstream. And in the bloodstream, it's going to travel all the way to the liver. And the liver is going to make another precursor. It's going to change it into another form of vitamin D. But that vitamin D is not active. So it has to, again, go back into the bloodstream and travel to the kidneys. And just when it gets to the kidneys, the vitamin D is going to transform in, into vitamin D3 or 125 cholecalciferol. And that's the active version of vitamin D3. So it is important that the liver and kidneys have are in good shape in order for successful synthesis of vitamin D. So it is complex. And remember that you can develop toxicity from this as well, but it's not common. However, it's always important to check your blood levels with your um, doctors long-term. And then some sources of vitamin D, which as you know, as you know, this is a lot of animal products and white mushrooms. The next one is vitamin E, which is also known as tocopherols. And you're gonna have four forms, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Now, alpha is the active form in the body and the supplement might have gamma or delta, which are okay, but they're not gonna make the same effect as alpha. But another form, if you're not sure, you can just get the mixed tocopherols. And that's another form of active um, E vitamins. So this works on the red blood cell support because it's like an antioxidant for red blood cells and protects the cell membranes, which is the border of the cells. Uh, it is great for atherosclerosis because it protects the damage of the arteries around, around this plaque premenstrual syndrome, allergies, and it works well with three other supplements, selenium, vitamin A, and vitamin C, because again, they work together as an antioxidant complex. And some forms of tocopherol or vitamin E foods, I will say the biggest one is wheat germ. Last but not least of the fat soluble vitamins is K, vitamin K. And as you notice, we're gonna focus mostly on K1 and K2, phyloquinone and menaquinone. Now menathione or K3 is a more of an equine or animal form, well, horse form of vitamin K3. So it's not something we have to worry about. But the first two are the ones that we worry about in human function. So it's used for clotting factors, basically to make platelets do their job when you have a wound and it needs to heal properly. It also works with bone buildup with menaquinone and phyloquinone. And it's great for brittle bones like osteoporosis and bleeding conditions, which again, many of them are genetic in nature. And it obviously, it works well with other fat-soluble vitamins. And remember, as a last reminder, that if you take fat-soluble vitamins, it is important to have some form of fatty foods. So the absorption increases in your system. And here are some foods high in vitamin K. And you'll notice that it's mostly leafy greens. Now, we're gonna go into macro minerals. And this is the list that we're gonna talk about, but it's not gonna be all of them. I'm just gonna talk about the, the main ones. So a mineral, I'm gonna make the definition of the mineral, which are charged chemical ions 
that have a specific function in the body. And macro are large amounts needed for the body. So it doesn't mean that it's big, but rather like we need a lot of it. So this kinds of minerals are the ones that we need a lot of. So the first one is calcium. As you know, it is the most advertised form of mineral in milk, cheese, and well, the dairy industry basically. Uh, so it is the most abundant. So it's about 1200 grams in the body, which is roughly about three pounds of your body weight is just calcium, which is actually a lot. It is essential for muscle movement, nerve signaling, and blood clotting. So it is important for a lot of things, just basic functions. Now, to be absorbed in the body, you need vitamin D. So both of them are absorbed together in the system. Now, fiber and phytate, which are compounds in some leafy greens, they interfere with calcium absorption. So be careful with that. And if you have high amounts of calcium, especially when you supplement high amounts, you can reach our calcification of arteries, which are basically little plaques being built up. And milk alkali syndrome, which is a systemic form where there is a lot of organ damage happening. Uh, so these are some functions of calcium. And here are some rich foods of calcium. And you'll notice that it's not just dairy, but also beans and broccoli and a lot of like leafy greens also carry calcium. The next one is phosphorus, which is mostly used in the body as phosphate, PO4-3. So this is the second most abundant, as 700 milligrams. And it's 80% stored in bone and 15% stored as bonding compounds. So it's nucleic acid construction, which essentially means DNA and RNA makeup. So it helps build those molecules. And it's also necessary for efficient production of ATP, which is your energy molecule. Without ATP, the body doesn't function and it dies. Uh, now, keep in mind that phosphorus can interfere with the kidneys. And these are some forms of phosphorus in the body. And some foods will include mostly the uh, meat, bread, dairy, and then some nuts and legumes. The next one is magnesium. Now this is an important one. So it is considered a cofactor of hundreds of enzymes. So let me just translate this. Enzymes are molecules, very large molecules that are mostly made of proteins that allow the process of chemicals to work effectively in the body. And magnesium allows this process to go smoothly. And we're talking about hundreds of processes in the cell. So we need magnesium for lots of different functions. So it makes cells work adequately if you want to make it simple. And deficiency includes anxiety, depression, cramps, palpitations, and constipation. So again, don't self-diagnose here. I'm just showing you what are some of the deficiency symptoms that you can find. Forms of magnesium include magnesium tartrate, which works more for the heart, magnesium citrate, which works on constipation, and it's also highly absorbable. And then magnesium glycinate, which more works on the nervous system, which can work on the muscles and the brain too. And then finally, magnesium oxide, which works with constipation, but more as a laxative. So it's low in absorption. So you can't really get too much magnesium into your body by taking the oxide form. So be, be watchful of that. And these are some of the usages of magnesium on how it, it works as transporting and work even in various forms of plant as well. 
And these are some rich foods such as spinach, avocado, peanuts, pumpkin seeds, and dark chocolate. Next one is sodium. So sodium actually comes from the Greek nitrum or the Latin natrium. That's why it's uh, written as Na in chemistry. Just a fun fact. And then it helps maintain the fluid balance between cells. Uh, if you are low in sodium, you'll feel fatigue and weakness. And that tends to happen when you have excessive vomiting or diarrhea. So you're losing lots of fluids. Um, some interactions, you sodium, a lot of sodium can deplete potassium and potassium can deplete sodium, which we'll see shortly. And then this is an interesting finding that table salt, NaCl, has a correlation to autoimmunity. So it's, easy, it's better if you replace your table salt with a natural form, such as sea salt, Himalayan sea salt, or sorry, Himalayan salt, or Celtic sea salt. And these are some, this is a study that showed how sodium chloride can induce cells of the immune system that actually cause autoimmune activation. So it's an, it was an interesting read and it sure shows this drive. So be careful with table salt. And these are some foods where you'll find sodium. And as you'll know, uh, a lot of foods already contain sodium in them. Next is potassium. Like we said, it's going to be the antagonist of sodium in a way. And it comes from the Latin kalium. That's why it's a K as an abbreviation. And it's a main intracellular fluid ion, which I'll explain shortly. So it keeps the inside of the cell working. And the deficiency is going to be similar to sodium, but it's more with cramps and arrhythmias, which can affect the heart. Interactions, so it depletes sodium and vice versa, like we said. And caffeine depletes potassium of your system. So it's easier to lose potassium than sodium. So be careful with that. So this is just a picture of how the balance between sodium and potassium are in the body. So you'll notice that the body wants to, or the cell, I should say, wants to keep more sodium in and then, sorry, potassium in and sodium out. That's going to be the balance. And these are some potassium-rich foods. And as you notice, there's a lot of veggies with it and electrolytes such as coconut water and pomegranate. Now we're going to move on to the trace minerals. And these are the list of the trace minerals. Again, we won't go over all of them, but we'll go over the main ones that are necessary for the body. So trace minerals also are also known as microminerals. So minerals being a chemical ion and micro meaning that you don't need that much, but you do need them. And deficiency can lead to difficulty recovering from health conditions. That's how, how I want you to look at this. So let's go the, into the first and probably most important one, iron because iron deficiency is the most common nutrient depletion in the world. So iron is needed for lots of things, obviously for hemoglobin, which is the production of, uh, well, the production of the molecule that transports oxygen and energy to the cells. So hemoglobin basically makes your red blood cells work how they're supposed to work. And if you're tired and you have anemia, you don't make that much hemoglobin or you cannot make that much hemoglobin. But another usage of iron is also on thyroid hormones, which are necessary for metabolic needs and immune function. Now absorption, it can work better when you eat garlic and onions with iron supplements or iron foods and also works well with vitamin C or the non-heme form of iron, which is the more uh, iron from non-animal products like veggies and some fruits. Uh, now, it decreases the absorption of zinc and copper, which are other minerals we'll talk about shortly. And the toxicity of iron, if you have it long-term, can make infections worse because bacteria 
can catch iron from your system and use it for themselves to stay alive longer. And of course, that's not something you want in your system. And then constipation is another sign of toxicity. So this is the molecule of hemoglobin. And as you notice in the center, you have iron molecule in there, Fe. And then these are some foods high in iron. So you'll notice that it's not just meat, but you can also get it in peanut butter, raisins, fortified cereals, spinach, beans, and even uh, beets. Next one is zinc. So zinc is good for many enzymes for the body, for the cells to function, very similar to magnesium, uh, but specifically for metalloproteins, which are proteins that allow RNA and DNA function properly. It also helps with detoxification of heavy metals and testosterone buildup. So for men, zinc supplementation is a good idea, especially if you're trying to reproduce or have children. Uh, absorption, it, it is decreased by phytates and fibers, like I said, similar to calcium. So be careful to eat, to take zinc with fiber. Uh, also copper, calcium, and non-heme iron can decrease the absorption of zinc into your body. And if you have a zinc deficiency, you're gonna notice taste loss and slow and low sperm count. So taste loss is something that we also see as a hallmark of COVID-19 infection. And you'll be surprised that a lot of people who had COVID-19 and supplemented with zinc, they, their recovery was much faster. And another thing too, zinc is also helpful for wound, wound healing and immunity. So if you have a low levels of it, you're gonna have decreased wound healing and decreased immunity. So this is zinc in the form of a metalloprotein, which again helps with DNA and RNA um, regulation. And these are some zinc-rich foods that I'm gonna say mostly is gonna be crab, oysters, and pumpkin seeds. Those are gonna be the main ones you wanna consume for zinc. Next one is copper. And copper is needed for moving iron from the liver, it's also helpful for blood clotting, melanin production, and wound healing. So melanin is basically the color of your skin. Absorption, it is decreased by zinc, vitamin C, iron, and molybdenum, which we'll talk about shortly. And toxicity of copper is going to lead to metabolizing estrogen. So estrogen in high amounts can be actually detrimental to women. So it is important to recycle it properly and copper helps with that. So these are some functions of copper and rich foods that are rich in copper. Again, leafy greens, tofu, organ meats, shiitake, and oysters. So taking oysters, you're gonna get a good amount of zinc and copper together. Next one is selenium. And selenium is good for the preservation of the innate antioxidant glutathione. So this helps this endogenous antioxidant, your own body makes this antioxidant to keep that in shape. It also helps with thyroid hormones and heavy metal detox. So Selenium has a lot of functions, even though it's a micromineral and viruses because of immunity. Now, absorption, it works well with vitamin E and omega-3s. Toxicity can cause brittle nails and birth defects. So again, don't want to overdo it either. Uh, so these are some of the examples of usage of selenium. And foods high in selenium would, I would say, mostly Brazil nuts. And then the last, well, not the last, but the next one is silica-rich foods, which is comes from silicon. So silicon is needed for bone and tissue stability, vessel stability, so like arteries and veins and lymphatic vessels. 
and the absorption is decreased with molybdenum, and toxicity can lead to kidney stones. Um, silica isn't something that we really are deficient in, mostly because we tend to take that in a lot of our foods. But it is important to keep it, especially if you're having problems with arteries and bones as the later stages of life, like elderly. Next one is manganese. Now, this is not magnesium. I know it sounds like magnesium, but it's manganese. So it's a different compound, a different metal. This one is needed for brain function, cartilage stability, immune suppression, and it competes with iron and calcium. So don't take those supplements together. Toxicity can lead to psychosis and Parkinsonism, which is symptoms of Parkinson. And this is something that we observe with dust miners who took a lot of the manganese dust in their environment. So these are some manganese rich foods, which again can be in a lot of places like uh, peanuts, spinach, pineapple, and wheat. Next one is chromium. And chromium is needed for normal insulin function. So people who have diabetes and sugar dysregulation, chromium is a good supplement to take. Also helps with serotonin function, with serotonin being the happy molecule or the bonding molecule, and bipolar and fat metabolism balance, basically. Uh, the absorption of chromium, niacin increases. Remember, niacin is B3. And foods that contain chromium include garlic, orange juice, and green beans. Next one is boron. And this is needed for steroid hormone building. So we're talking like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and other ones too, but those are the three main ones. It helps with vitamin D action, and obviously it's going to help with bone health because vitamin D is also good for the bones. Deficiency in boron, you'll see that with magnesium. If you have low magnesium, you're going to likely to have low boron levels. And then foods high in boron will be like some chestnuts, grapes, apricots, and apples. And the next one is molybdenum, which is another mineral used for liver health. It's going to help with arthritis, asthma, and alcohol detox. So it's a very tiny mineral and doesn't have much popularity in it, but it should be more popular because it is an essential mineral for detoxification of the liver. And it just helps the liver do its job better. So let's talk about other minerals, just like one or two points on them. Iodine is for thyroid hormone creation. Cobalt, as you notice, is going to be part of B12 compound. As you said, if you notice in the middle of B12, cobalamin, cobalt is the main compound of that. And then fluoride, which is going to be calcification of tissue, which includes teeth. That's why uh, toothpaste contains fluoride in their formula. So some common sources of iodine will include mostly salt, sea salt, supplements, and some foods like seafood. Uh, there, here is cobalamin or cobalt. As you notice, that's in the blue circle. That's where the cobalt is, is in B12. And then iodine working for your enamel and the bone structures. So that is all that I have for today. And remember to consult with a healthcare professional who is trained in nutritional sciences, because even though we talked about nutrition and in the process of vitamins and minerals, we still need caution when taking supplements of this. So I wish you have the best judgment for that with yourself and your family. And I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for your attention. 
and have a great rest of your day.